what are the dwarf planets? We'll have a formal definition for them later in this video, but first we're going to build our way up to them. And we'll start by defining planetesimals, and that's just the leftover material after the sun and the planets and moons formed. There was just lots of debris that you left out there. The asteroids, the comets, the meteoroids. The dwarf planets are a special class of these planetesimals, and in our solar system we found five of them. Pluto, Hame, Makemake, Eries, and Ceres. Now the first four live way out in the Kuiper Belt, whereas Ceres is the only dwarf planet that we know of that lives in the asteroid belt. Now, Ceres used to be labeled an asteroid. It used to have the title as the biggest asteroid in the solar system. But now with the definitions we've accepted, Ceres has been reclassified as a dwarf planet. And not a single one of you cried foul when that happened. Here's a collection of the dwarf planets and their, uh, some of them even have moons associated with them. And the, the years underneath them, that corresponds to the time that we found them. So Ceres, uh, being an asteroid, was found in 1801. Whereas Pluto came around next, eventually we found Pluto's moon, Charon, and the other star to come into picture here, Hame, Makemake, and Eries. Eries having its own moon, Dysomnia, too. Let's go into a bit more detail on Pluto, the dwarf planet that almost all of us know of. Details about it, it's about 1 400th the mass of the Earth and some could categorize it as what's called a double dwarf planet. Karen has a lot of the distinguishing features that would meet some of our definitions of being a dwarf planet, but with the terminology that we use, we've settled on that Karen is the moon of Pluto, whereas Pluto is the dwarf planet. But there's still some debate about whether pluto Karen should be a double dwarf system. Regardless, that's a nitpicky thing. What does matter is that Pluto has a very eccentric orbit, and it's composed of rock and ice, almost like a bigger moon that's just out there. And it will have a thin methane atmosphere. Here's Pluto and its moon Charon in sight, and uh, let's bring these, let's enhance, go a little bit bigger, and just see some of the gorgeous details. Of all the pictures out there in astronomy, I have to say, this one of Pluto is by far my absolute favorite. Just seeing the wide range of features and colors that can be present on this lone object Pluto far out there. Absolutely love it. So enough gushing from me. Here's images of Karen. You can see how we have some ridges up here on its uh, kind of northern pole. And clearly some levels of geological activity with the smoothness and ridges around its almost equator. Zooming in further onto Pluto, we can see regions that are mountains. And we can have uh, the blues highlighting the different uh, uh, geological active regions. These rounds can rise up to you know, three, four kilometers above the surrounding surface features of Pluto. And so this very much implies that Pluto is big enough to have geological and tectonic activity happening on it. With all that said, we come back to the question, well, why is Pluto no longer a planet? It seems to act like a planet. It looks like one. It has the features of one. So why, why change the status? Well, let's start to build up that picture. Let's start to build up why we need something that falls outside the definitions of a dwarf, uh, the definitions of planet versus dwarf planet. And we'll go ahead and just fire off this uh, animation showing the orbits of the outer objects. So let's fire off that video and watch how Pluto orbits around. The gray lines, that represents the depth above now, above the elliptic plane, and here it's going to be start going below the ecliptic plane. So Pluto does this crazy thing, let's go ahead and let it repeat, of intersecting with the ecliptic plane, going up, going above, and then notice where Neptune's at, 
crossing down below and it crosses inside the path of Neptune so Pluto has this tilted orbit and it crosses with another planet here's a look at Pluto's orbit from the side and you see how very much comes in down below the elliptic plane and out above and the angle that it makes is about a 17 degree angle let me go ahead and kill the animation here and you can see that it's about 17 degrees off of the ecliptic plane let's bring the animation back and watch it there's that 17 degree angle above and below the ecliptic plane that Pluto does so we're starting to see arguments for why Pluto is a little bit weirder than our planets and then things got more complicated when we discovered Aries in 2005 Aries falls into that category as another trans-Neptunian object and it is larger than Pluto and w along with it it has a moon Dysomnia and the question becomes well should Aries be considered another planet that just has a moon going around it this image here was uh, images of how Aries was discovered it's this little spot here and we saw it shifting just a little bit down that was enough to confirm that Aries was out there well let's look at Aries orbit compared to Pluto <laughs> and so if here's Pluto going in and out of the ecliptic plane here's Aries an object more massive than Pluto flying around at an inclination of 44 degrees so this this is the problem now Pluto lives out in the Kuiper belt and we know there are thousands of other uh, objects out there in the Kuiper belt and we keep finding objects even more massive than Pluto doing these crazier orbits so should Aries be called a planet should Pluto or should we refine our definition let's stack the facts in favor of Pluto either Pluto is a planet or it's another one of those small bodies out in the solar system well, Pluto's discovery this is great evidence it's something that's orbiting the Sun it's gotta be a planet then people started looking at its composition. It was more like a moon than, say, like the gas giants. Well, maybe it's just a terrestrial way out there. Sure. But its orbit crosses Neptune. None of the other planets have that issue of having a planet literally flying through its rotation around the sun. By 1978, Pluto's moon, Charon, was discovered. Well, Charon made this this weird orbit where Pluto isn't exactly orbiting the sun. It has this weird double body system where you have Pluto and Charon, and they're both doing these awkward, instead of Pluto going around the sun, they're both kind of going around their common center of mass. So it becomes like this weird concept of, is this a double planet system? Is it just a planet with a moon that's almost its same mass? Because this huge conundrum. Keep going, and we start finding other Plutoids. And so that, all this stacked together, we eventually had to decide that we need a rigorous definition. What is a planet versus this new category that we'd called dwarf planets? Here is going to be our now formal definition. So what is the difference between a planet and a dwarf planet? And this is a agreed upon by the International Astronomical Union. And this isn't just a group of astronomers and scientists getting together. This is based on input and feedback from well, people like you, the public. We honestly think that everyone has an invested interest in astronomy, and so everyone should get a chance to participate in it. So here's where we're going to go with this. A planet is a celestial body that, for starters, is in orbit around the sun. Can't be a moon, right? Have to be orbiting just the sun. And you have to have a, a sufficient amount of mass for 
self-gravity to squeeze you down into a sphere. It means that you're reaching hydrostatic equilibrium. Basically, that just means that you are so massive that you can crush yourself into a spherical shape due to gravity. We'll see pictures of asteroids that have weird, like, double bodies connected by a slim neck, or like long cigar shapes, or just weird, cracked, chaotically shaped rocks. And so, in order to be a planet, you have to be massive enough to get away from those ridges, get away from those weird shapes, and crush yourself into a sphere. And lastly, you have to clear your neighborhood. You can't be in a neighborhood filled with lots of other material. You can't. You just have to have, have basically, your mass was big enough that you scooped up all the material around you. Now, a dwarf planet is going to be very similar. A dwarf planet has to be in orbit around the sun. You still have to have sufficient mass for hydrostatic equilibrium so that the dwarf planets are also spherical in shape. And one of the distinguishing characteristics is that a dwarf planet has not cleared its neighborhood. It's going to intersect with other things. It's going to have other asteroids or potential comets around itself. And this last bullet point is effectively a repeat of A, but we need to specify it is not a satellite. Charon is considered a moon of Pluto, not its own dwarf planet, because Charon is a satellite of Pluto. Everything else falls into this broad category of just the small solar system bodies, the asteroids and the comets and the meteoroids. The last dwarf planet we'll talk about in detail is going to be Ceres, and this is a repeat. It was discovered in 1801, considered an asteroid at that point. It is the largest body in the asteroid belt, and for comparison, it's got a diameter just shy of a thousand kilometers, whereas the moon's diameter is 3,500 kilometers. So we're seeing how the Ceres is a much smaller object. A quarter of the mass of Ceres is this water ice mantle that's surrounding this rocky inner core. Now the little white spectacle that you're seeing there, that's not you know a, a glitch on your screen, and it's not just photos trying to enhance and highlight something. This is a real image. There truly is this white spot on the surface of Ceres. So let's zoom in and look at this. This is a crater that's about 80 kilometers wide. These bright spots uh, also can be referred to as foculi. And in 2015, scientists looking at it said, hey, this is a bunch of salt reg residue. Not table salt, not NACL. You're not going to be dipping your fries in the salt from Ceres. These are different chemical salts. But where did this come from? What we think is that there's this briny solution underneath the surface and when this crater impacted it basically created this opening for that briny water to be exposed to the exterior of Ceres, be exposed to the vacuum of space. The, the liquids and that salty solution just immediately sublimated, went just immediately vaporized and floated away and it left the salty residue.